Hi, friends. Welcome back to With Great People, the podcast for high performance teams. I'm Richard Kasparowski. Our special guest today is Jorgen Hesselberg. Jorgen is an old friend, and he's the author of the book Unlocking Agility an insider's guide to agile enterprise transformation. And he's the co-founder of Comparative Agility. To support this podcast, visit my website, kasparowski.com. Hey, Jorgen, how's it going? (laughs) Hey, how's it going, Richard? (laughs) I'm fine. It's so good to see you. I'm so glad we can catch up. It's been like, uh, I think it's been 13 months since the last time we actually saw each other face to face. How you been? I have been, I would imagine, like everyone else, uh, sort of holed up in my office. Uh, and it's been um, one of those weird uh, scenarios where I've probably been more places than I've ever been in some sense, because I've been <laughs> right. all over the place calling into people from Africa and Asia and Europe and North America. Right. I say point, this too. Today, 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 I'm in, today I'm in Oslo. Today you're in Boston. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, when I come downstairs, I'm like, hey, Molly, my wife. Hey, Molly, I'm going to Oslo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so weird. But of course, you don't get the tastes and the food yeah. and, the, and the smells and all those things that, with those cultures. So you miss something. But hey, at least you get a chance to visit a lot of different contexts. So that's cool. Yeah, totally. Uh, let's see. So I introduced you as the author of that great book. It really is a good book, Unlocking Agility and co-founder of Comparative Agility. Is there anything else you want to share uh, by way of introduction? Uh, I think that sums up most of it. I am uh, one of those agile nerds. I, I, I mean, I really believe in this stuff and I have for 20 years. Mm-hmm. So so for me, this is this is not a, a thing that's um, something I do for a living. Uh, it's something I do because I, 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 I live it. Right. <laughs> I don't do it for a living. I do it because I live it. And, uh, and I believe deeply in agile ways of working. So this is this is fascinating with me. And you are one of those people that, uh, you know, we connected early on. I think it's been almost 10 years ago since mm-hmm. we first met. And and I could tell that I had met a, a soulmate in that sense. You you <laughs> have the same, you know, we we talked about agility way before agility was a thing. You know, the, 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 this was this was really early days of scaling anything. And uh, and you and I had that same connection, which was really inspiring for me because there wasn't that many people out there who was talking like that. So, mm-hmm. yeah, this is this is I'm really really thrilled to be on the, on your show. I'm I'm humbled and honored by the word soulmate. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> really? well, you know how it is. When you have actually, a connection. I, I totally <laughs> feel it. I totally feel that connection. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and we met um, something like ten years ago. Uh, we were both working for this this giant and at that time successful company called Nokia. Uh, what was you? You have a really funny story about joining the company Nokia. How did that story go? Oh, there's so many stories around that. And I mean, uh, you think Wait, about the you, na- like you, uh, yeah, you, 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 you signed up for a job at some company. <laughs> Yes, Nav- Navtech. Uh, is that what you're thinking of? Yeah. yeah. I signed up for Navtech, and uh, it didn't take too long before they were uh, acquired by Nokia. And uh, I think it was a couple of months later, and suddenly your paycheck had a different logo, yeah. and, and <laughs> suddenly now you're Nokia. And uh, I, I think that happens to a lot of people. It's kind of funny how that works out. It's like, oh, okay, that's funny. I guess it's Nokia now. But hey, that was a great experience. That company, uh, I think, if you think about Agile alumni, I mean, talk about a legacy that that uh, Nokia has left. Uh, you know, sometimes I go back to my LinkedIn profile and I look at the people that I worked with at that time, uh, and and you go back and you think of things like you know, like less, uh, like scaled agile framework, uh, like the Nokia test. You know, all those things that we sort of take for granted that has been there now for many years. Those have their origins uh, to Nokia. So. Uh, for, for good and bad. <laughs> so, yeah, so, uh, but so, yeah, Nokia was definitely a pioneer uh, in the agile space and very mm-hmm. fortunate to have been working there. And to remind myself about Nokia, I've got this uh, this cup. This is my pilfered coffee cup from the Helsinki office. <laughs> it's like the, the, the Nokia name on the back. Oh, that's it. awesome. <laughs> Nokia House. Remember that? That was such yeah, a great yeah, place. Nokia yeah. House, I worked in the, in the Helsinki office, which was sort of hipper. And yes. well, let's see, the Espo office, the design people up on the higher floors overlooking the, the lake or whatever that was, that was yes. some pretty sweet office space. Oh. That uh, but I really loved old. I really loved working in the city versus uh, just just outside the city. Right, it was really fun. <laughs> You're always really more fun. urban than me. I, I never <laughs> went. I never went to the the Helsinki office. I was in the Espo office, and mm-hmm. Nokia House was uh, such a marvel of architecture. You know, so much oh, wood, yeah. and 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 light, really and and lots of lots of windows, just natural light everywhere. Yeah, ah, 
gorgeous, gorgeous place. Yeah, it was a really nice place to be. And and we we still had uh, we'll pronounce it like this. We had sauna even in the even in the yeah. <laughs> even in the office in the city. We had sauna. Yes. You know what? I think that was like a mandate. Every single Nokia <laughs> office. I mean, in, in Chicago, even they had a I think, sauna. <laughs> I think we had a. I think we had sauna. I think, I think the way you said is we have sauna. Yeah, we, we have in sauna. American English. It's, we had a. We had a sauna. <laughs> Uh, we had a sauna in the Boston office as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that one, I, re- I never really adopted that. Uh, that tradition. It was totally different. It was so different, and the yeah. whole idea of you know sitting there more or less buck naked with your boss just, just seemed <laughs> awkward to me. So I never really did that thing. I mean, sauna and work. I mean, yeah, you had to yeah. be Finnish, I think, to really appreciate that part. I, I used to say, I'm going to say it. I was, I was thinking about whether I should say this out loud or not. I used to say things to, to friends who weren't Finnish or weren't from from Nokia. Be like, yeah, just had a, we just had an uh, we just had an offsite meeting. Uh, it was you know me and twenty other naked guys. <laughs> and where do you work? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, yeah, sounds, the... it sounds weird from an American <laughs> perspective, but it, it, it was totally normal. And actually, it was it was pretty great. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And after that, we went into the snow and just uh, oh, <laughs> enjoyed yeah. the cold uh, cold shower. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, just, it's an interesting uh, tradition. <laughs> and apparently, it gets your mind thinking, that's for sure. Your blood definitely gets pumping. Definitely. So, uh, yeah, it, it does have its uh, therapeutic oh. <laughs> reasons. Funny, funny cultural things. and. And 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 you're Norwegian, so apparently this is different between even the northern countries. <laughs> yes, yeah, the fin- the Finnish people, you know, they're wonderful people, but they're definitely a little different from uh, from the, the rest of the Scandinavians. Uh, I think the Swedes will say the same thing, and the Danes. Um, but yeah, they're, they're they're sort of like their own their own special kind, and uh, and, it, and uh, it's awesome, right? They're yeah. awesome. They're awesome. They have a certain there's a certain personality. You know, yeah. there's a good friend of mine from from Ericsson, uh, Henrik Esser. He has this joke, you know, he works with a lot of people from Finland and they will not be offended when I say this. And sometimes, uh, you know, since this is a webcast, I can show you. And he says, here's how a Finnish person looks when he's happy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> here's how a Finnish person looks when he's sad. Yeah, we got all the Finnish jokes about emo- emoting, right? <laughs> emoting. It really is no difference. And and that's okay. They're proud of it, too. I think, you know, if you think about dear, the pandemic. Dear Finnish friends, I hope you're not offended by this. In fact, I heard most of these jokes from you, my dear Finnish friends. Yes. So. <laughs> that is exactly right. That's where they come from. They're not easily uh, they're not easily offended. Hey, and they have a proud history, too, where they have... They've been able to fight back uh, very quickly. So, so these guys are not someone who will be easily offended by by any means. <laughs> All right, Jorgen. So talking about some old times, uh, some old teams we've been around together. This is the podcast about great teams. Uh, so what I like to ask, and you saw this little outline, maybe you've heard one of these episodes before. Uh, what's the best team of your life? Best team yeah. that you have ever been a member of? And that is such a fascinating question because, you know, you go through and you think of all the teams you've been in and there's there's many. And I like the way you also define teams. It's, it's more than just the work stuff. It can also mm-hmm. be, you know, uh, your, your wife and your kids mm-hmm. and your family and those kind of things. But I sort of went a little more on the professional side just to kind of keep it uh, on that end. And, and, and I actually ended up going way back to 1999 when I was an intern and later on in 2000 where I was joining a company called Hewitt Associates. And I joined a team uh, called Revcast, which mm-hmm. was uh, short for Revenue Forecasting, uh, and it was a team of five people, uh, and and we were developing products, uh, software, in Microsoft Access yeah. <laughs> using VBA, and I got to say that was uh, probably the most fun and I would say objectively the best team I've ever been on. Um, so okay. it, it was a wonderful experience. Fun and objectively the best. And um, when you take yourself back to that team, right? Uh, you know, this is kind of funny because you're so smiley and happy. You, just, <laughs> you have the smiley face, and I and I love looking at your face. I don't I don't want to tell you to close your eyes. I never tell anybody to do anything. <laughs> Uh, sometimes people, you know, take themselves back to this team. I can see that you've already taken yourself back to this team. When you re-experience the team, and I can tell by your face that you are re-experiencing yes. <laughs> the team. Uh, what, what, what's the one word that you could use to summarize to that, 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 that feeling of that team? That one word. Oh, that, I, I'm, I'm torn between two words, actually, because there's, and maybe those are a little bit related, but I'm torn between pride and fun. 
Okay. Uh, th- th- those are the two words that pop up, and maybe maybe pride, if anything else, because part of this was probably because I was very young. You know, it, this was my first job out of college, so to be on a team like this was was something I was very proud of. But we had a lot of fun too. This was not it didn't feel like work, and uh, it it was just a very inspiring time to 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 be doing this kind of stuff because you were working with other people that you you really I, you don't want to use the word love mm-hmm. i love those people they were my brothers and sisters in arms and and we felt we were doing something that truly made an impact um so there was a lot of pride but we had a ton of fun too and when you say pride what do you, what do you mean there was this ownership that we got because what what this was so so originally i think our group was called ad hoc development which is kind of a strange name for a group but <laughs> i think what we were supposed to be was basically that let's say you had some some technical issue and you needed some sort of custom solution to it they would throw us at it and we would help business people to solve a problem and usually it would be maybe making a macro or or maybe like a quick um, you know integration or something like this but the thing is, this uh, this revenue forecasting program uh, started off as a glorified spreadsheet and ended up being a, a Microsoft Access application, and it was never supposed to be an enterprise-wide application. It was, I mean, it's Microsoft Access. The problem was, it was so darn good uh-huh. that the, the business people loved it, and they said, "I want this thing." So we ended up distributing this out. I think at, at the most, we had over a 1,000 users. Wow. Uh, and we were handling over, the, over $3 billion worth of revenue. And well, on the other hand, we had PeopleSoft, which is really supposed to do this kind of stuff, uh, who had a staff of you know 25 people, lots of consultants, lots of budget. And the business people didn't want to use PeopleSoft because PeopleSoft had a process that says, hey, this is how you do revenue mm. forecasting. But we just did it the way people wanted it. So they would say, hey, can you do this? Or can you make this report? Or can you make sure I can have this view? And we would say, mm-hmm. give me give me 10 days, you know, and we'll see what we can do. And we just we worked in iterations of five to 10 days, depending on how big the thing was. And then we delivered it. And the guys would say, that's perfect. Yeah. Now, can you do this thing? And then we did that. <laughs> and we just kept working like this. And ultimately, the users love the application so much. So when the technical folks said, oh, you cannot use Microsoft Access because it's not an enterprise application and blah, 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 they would say, you know what? You know who actually pays the bills here? It's yeah. me. I'm the business guy. I want that. And then yeah. it didn't take long before you know we basically dominated uh, that particular area of the, of the business. And I think PeopleSoft didn't like it. We were very proud of it because we felt it was kind of like a rebel group <laughs> against uh, the mothership, you know? So, yeah, I think that was part of what made that such a special experience. Very cool, very cool. And you're talking about, um, you know, some of the ways that you know this was a great team, uh, these, these objective ideas, first of all, that, it, wow, you had a 1,000 users, over a 1,000 users. It's probably the largest scale, I don't know, for sure. It's, a, it's the largest scale access app I've ever heard of. Right, it's supposed to be like a one-user system. <laughs> yes, I know exactly what you mean. And and if you're interested in some of the technical stuff, I could tell you about uh, how we handled replication, for instance, which was a massive system. Uh, you know what? Uh, we've had discussions around this, and I, apparently there are really, really large access systems out there. <laughs> so we're probably not by any means the largest, but we were among the largest. This was Access 97 that we built this thing in. It wasn't even 2000, which was a <laughs> NT-built system. So that was a much more advanced system. We were really built on a desktop solution Mm -hmm. that uh, we were able to make work really well. And I think part of what made me objectively know that this was uh, something people liked was A, you know, people wanted it. They asked for it, you know, and and this was, this was kind of before the consumer really mattered too much in internal software. I think you can see now that, you know, if you look at, um, you know, Robinhood or you know, even TurboTax or other applications that, that you can consider are a little bit more on the business side. They're now more consumer friendly. Yeah. But back in the day, you know, if you think of, I mean, I don't speak ill of, of, of enterprise applications, but if you think of SAP and PeopleSoft and those things, they were clearly not customer focused at all. They said, here's how the process work. And it is your job as a consumer to learn the process, not the other yeah. way around. Yeah. We were not built like that. You know, we were custom built from scratch. So we said, hey, you know, whatever works for these people is what we're going to do. And, you know, part of the reason I know this was successful is that when we did, and this is probably something I, I couldn't have told you unless this was 20 years ago, mm-hmm. when we did annual reporting and SEC reports, they were using data that came straight out of Microsoft Access 97, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, which I'm sure that <laughs> People don't want to say loud, but 
they use that data to report on, on external metrics. And yeah. clearly then they trusted us and clearly users liked us. So, and, and I think the biggest sense of pride I had was when the PeopleSoft group invited us over <laughs> and asked us our approach to design. They were saying, how did you come up with your GUI? <laughs> we had no formal design background at all. We just talked yeah. to customers. Yeah. Um, but that was really exciting to kind of hear PeopleSoft <laughs> folks that we really looked up to as sort of like the real engineers. Uh, tell us uh, or ask us how we how we did that. But uh, anyway, yeah, sorry. Uh, this this is really this this meant a lot to me. That was a really really important yeah totally really important project. And, and, and now in retrospect, I realized that what we were were essentially a very very agile team. Mm-hmm. All of those things that we now later on look at as a sort of you know typical agile stuff, we did. Uh, we just didn't have words for it at the time. Right, right. How did you come up with the idea for this? Well, our, our our users came over and, and you know we went over to them or whatever and, and we talked to each other. Yes. <laughs> Individuals and interactions. <laughs> we uh, we asked them what they want. How do exactly. You that idea? We asked them what they want. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We actually listened to them and, and when they would and we would have a really nice sort of partnership. There was this whole the customer collaboration idea really did happen because they yeah. would come over and 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 they would also be really respectful because it felt like a a sort of a, a team of equals in the yeah. sense that they wouldn't just say here's what I want and then that's it. They looked at us as people who could really help them. So yeah. they would say, hey, you know, let me tell you first why I'm having some challenges with this or that. And then once we understood what their problem was, we were like, well. I was going to do this thing here, but obviously that doesn't make sense because ultimately this is probably going to help them more. So we did these things, uh, not based on large requirements, but based on really great conversations with people. Uh, and then we tested it uh, extensively with them before we launched it and made it yeah. uh, made it public. So the whole uh, MVP idea, uh, yeah. customer collaboration, mobbing. I mean, you know, that team was a team of five people and none of them were, uh, there's probably one person who you could consider a traditional engineer. The rest was a philosophy major, a journalism major. Uh, one was an ordained pastor, uh, although that wasn't his full-time job. Uh, and then there was uh, someone who had a, a, had a slight design background, but not in – it was in textile design, not in computer design. Sure. But we got together, and we were in the same room, and we were over each other's shoulders, but, but not in a controlling way. It was more like, hey, how do you figure this one thing out? Or yeah. – it was such a, I don't know, it, it was very inspiring. You know, we talked about flow, you know, earlier before we recorded here. And that was what that was. We were in flow as we were working. And uh, oh. the days just kind of just, well, flew by. That's beautiful. You were in flow together as, as this team of five. It was a but, lot of fun. So what else subjectively, this the sensation of flow? I don't know if that's objective or subjective, but... What else about flow or what else about subjectively knowing or feeling that this is the best team of your life? Well, you know, I think some of that feeling when you look forward to going to work, Mm -hmm. I think that's a good sign that you enjoy what you're doing and that you're probably on a high-performing team. The other thing is, and this is one thing that I don't think we talk about very often, but uh, we work really long hours, but Mm -hmm. not because we had to we did it because we wanted to i remember you know when we were doing this we had uh, it was replicated through i think it was 11 different location locations across the us and uh, even canada and the the challenge we would have sometimes is that uh, we would replicate these databases the one an access database is not robust enough that you could actually have one database where all 11 locations would access the data uh, we would have replication errors and there would be corruption so we would actually have to have 11 separate databases that would every night uh, replicate each other and and essentially be pushed out to the users and uh, this would fail quite frequently. So we would have to go in at night because uh, there was no support other than us. So yeah. we would go in at night and fix the stuff. Yeah. And But you know what? It wasn't like, oh, you know, this sucks. It wasn't that kind of thing. It was like, you know what? My baby needs me here. My application is down. I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to fix yeah. it. Uh, and yeah, and of course, part of this was that I'm young. I was young. I didn't have kids and those, those kind of things. But yeah, we, we put a lot of hours into making this thing, not just the sweat and the tears part, but also in making it better because we learned from that and we said, hey, how can we automate this and make sure this doesn't happen again? Uh, and it ended up being a very robust system uh, through, you know, pride and grit, but also some long hours, but it didn't feel like it. And I think that's the difference. It didn't feel like work. It was just like, you know, yeah. we're doing it because it's uh, something you were very proud of. Yeah, yeah, that feeling. I, um, 
be- before we, we 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 did the introduction to the podcast, we were chatting, and and I was saying something about flow and playing piano, and you're like, oh, I've never thought of flow that way. But it's it's the sense that you pointed out to me that you lose track of time. The hours yes. didn't matter. Yes, and, it, and this is a wonderful place to be because then you suddenly you're not working anymore. You're you're being and uh, and yeah, the, the paycheck is nice, but that's not at all why you do this. Uh, it really isn't. Uh, it's really about you know being together with people and like like you say, great work or, or great performance with great people, and that's what that's all about. And you become. I like the way you use the word love in these contexts because because uh, because there is a sense of love that it gets established. Uh, I guess similar to what what happens when you're in the army, perhaps, and you have someone with you there having your back, mm-hmm. uh, because you're sort of you're in there and you're building something and you're creating something, and there's always going to be conflict and and things like this. But you work through it together, and ultimately, when you can see that you're making a difference, and and users are sending you an email saying, you know what, this made such a big difference to me. That's all you need to hear. And your day yeah. is just made, you know? Yeah, totally, totally. Uh, what are what are some of the concrete behaviors that you and your teammates conducted? What, what are some of the things you did together on this team very concretely that that, that led to the success? Um, like the, the way the team operated was, in, in retrospect, very sort of agile. We definitely mm-hmm. uh, did, did mob programming. Uh, it wasn't called that then, but that's definitely how it was. We all had our main sort of roles. Like we had a, a dude who was kind of like the testing dude. And then we had a person who was a little bit more technically advanced than most of us. So he did most of the, the hardcore coding. Uh, and then it was uh, someone like me who was like, could, could do some Mickey Mouse programming, but also had a little bit of a design eye. Uh, and then there was a, a lady from India who who had this really cool perspective around analytics. I mean, we were all kind of in together. So, but but I think the thing is that collaboration was really uh, fast. It was real time. We trusted each other, and we were empowered. And now, of course, we have a name for that, psychological safety. Right. We could make mistakes without feeling that, you know what, this is the end of the world. Because our manager, to his credit, he he, he really be- he wasn't a traditional engineer either. He was one of those people who just really believed in creating a, creating a great product, not that it had to be done in a certain way. So he was really more about, hey, if you believe this is the way to do this, you probably know more about this than I do. So yeah. I trust that. And you know what? There were times we made mistakes, but the great thing is we could revert that quickly. So, so I, you know, in terms of concrete behaviors, I would say that extreme collaboration or mobbing, uh, I would say that empowerment, being able to make mistakes without being, you know, really punished for that, uh, and, and being close to customers, being mm-hmm. having access to customers so that we can check and say, hey, are we on the right path here? Is this, is this what you're looking for? Uh, and creating that trusting relationship so that when we did mess up, uh, we wouldn't going to get some terrible call. They would say, you know what? I see what you were doing there. That wasn't quite what I was looking for. Yeah. Do you think you can do something about that? And, and of course, that's a different conversation than if you get yelled at and, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So Beautiful, beautiful. How about advice for listeners to be able to take some of this experience and reproduce it on their own team? Yeah, I thought a long, long time about that. And I've been in situations where I'm, I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to recreate that. Of course, and, of and course. I th- this is the work you <laughs> right? You're right. I, I want to see more of that. And, and to be fair, I, I've been on, a, I would say, two or three really great high-performing teams, you know, after that. Uh, but I also say that this is not, uh, I think, a, a linear predictive process where you can say, I do ABC and voila, I have a predictive uh, high-performing team. There is an element of magic there that I am not entirely sure what is. I, I, I sort of equate it to innovation in general. Like you can create an environment where I think the uh, the luck surface, if you want to call it that, expands. And I think the chances of it happening <laughs> is probably bigger. But I think that it's not a guarantee, you know? So, so, so you have to have that diversity of thought. You need to have that empowerment. You need to be able to, you know, be close to the customer and quickly validate your assumptions. But even though you have those things, there's no guarantee that that will actually happen. Because part of that is probably the personalities, you know, with these people that, you know, why is it that certain people click and certain people don't? You know, that that kind of magic, mm-hmm. uh, that I haven't figured out. So um, I, I'm not sure if I can tell you that there's the recipe, but I think part of, you know, the things you talk about, I think is exactly the types of norms and behaviors that I think increases the chances of those things happening. Mm-hmm. Awesome, awesome. I, I love this uh, this phrase. The luck surface. What's that? Yeah, that's right. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean that's what we're trying to to increase essentially. You know that 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 surface of luck when within within that surface, you know, good things happen, uh, and, and whatever we can do to expand that, uh, I think is our job as leaders, uh, which you know serendipity, I guess, is another word for it. It's it's not mm. easy to do those things, uh, and I guess that's why great leaders are are far and few between. All right, all right. Let's see. So um, I know you have you, you have your book there on the desk. Hold it up to the camera. Let's see, let's see <laughs> yeah, that I have it out there. <laughs> there it is. Unlocking there agility we go. by Jorgen Hesselberg. <laughs> and behind you, you got the banner for your company, Comparative yeah. Agility. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, man. Yeah, no, I, I, feel, I feel really passionate about both those. I think the, the best thing I like about Comparative Agility is that it is not one of those sort of like uh, color by numbers type of situations. It's, a, it's truly a platform that reveals where you might have challenges and helps you ask better questions. It mm -hmm. doesn't give you the answers. And I think a lot of people get sort of put off by that. They say, well, you're telling me that I do this analysis and you won't tell me what to do? I said, no, no, but I will help you ask better questions and know who to ask about what. But oh. you still have to do the work. I mean, this doesn't take away the job of coaches and great leadership. Um, you know, we're not uh, creating widgets here. If we were, right. then yeah, I could probably tell you exactly what to do. You are in a complex adaptive system. So it would be very intellectually honest or dishonest of me to tell you that after a survey, you will do this and this and you'll be agile. That just doesn't mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can help you shine the light where it matters. Um, and I think that is all you can ask for when it comes to systems like this. All right. And, and is there anything else you'd like to add? No, just thank you so much for having me on. This was such oh, a blast. And, and uh, we, should, we should do this every week. <laughs> <laughs> Any excuse to see you and hang out and chat. Yeah, totally. Uh, let's see. How could listeners contact you? Oh, uh, pretty simple. Uh, I think, uh, well, the easiest one is probably just email. I'm, I'm old school and I, I'm, I'm a nerd. So if you have any questions around agility or anything like that, I'd love to talk about that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, Jorgen at comparativeagility.com. That's the address for that. Uh, I'm on Twitter now and then. Don't do too many things. That's Jay Hesselberg. Um, but those are probably the two things that I use most. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've also seen the company. It's a small company. I've seen I've seen the company on Twitter. Uh, I think it's Comparative Agility. Or Com what is it? Comparative. That is right. Comparativeagility.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we're definitely going to be out there, and then we we, we keep uh, having a lot of cool content from our authors as it happens. <laughs> so so you'll uh, you'll hear more about that too. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. Jorgen Hesselberg, thank you. <laughs> Richard. <laughs> it is so good to see you. So good to hang out and chat. I really, 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 you know, I really appreciate this. Uh, hey, thanks so much for joining pleasure. us today. Thank you so much. And next time, let's have a beer in person. <laughs> yeah.